So our last presenter is Vili Nell. He will be talking about synthetic aperture radar in support of the South African aerospace sector. Vili asked me not to read his <laughs> bio, but I will read it anyway. And I will highlight the parts that he said I should highlight. Okay, so he's a CSIR chief radar engineer and the technology and innovation manager for the organization's radar research group. He holds an MSc in digital image processing from the University of Cape Town and has been working passionately in the field of radar since 1999. His areas of expertise include radar systems design, radar imaging, radar target recognition, and radar signal processing. His current area of focus is the design and development of satellite and unmanned aerial vehicle synthetic aperture radar systems. He has published several papers in the areas of radar target recognition and radar imaging and acts as a reviewer for premier radar journals and conferences. He is a senior member of the IEEE and has been serving on the IEEE radar systems panel since 2016. He has also served on and chaired the IEEE Dennis J. Pickard Medical Committee and has taken part in two NATO working groups. He is happily married and treasures spending time with his children. That's the only part he wanted you to remember, that he's happily married <laughs> and likes spending time with his children. Welcome, Vili. Thank you very much. Um, I think I'm not going to hide here in the shadows. I don't like hiding in the shadows. So if you can hear me and see me here, is it okay if I stand here with the camera? Okay, so I think, um, thank you to both the previous speakers. I think you couldn't have set the stage for me any better. Even, even if I wanted to do it myself, I wouldn't have been able to do it better. The first speaker basically showed us all the incredible impact that working in space can have in terms of all the things that happens in the ecosystem and all the companies that happens. I was just last night at a opening function for a new facility of new space systems down in the Cape. Um, they basically have built a whole extra new building because they're manufacturing these components that, that she was talking about uh, and exporting them all out of the country for other missions all, all across the world. And basically, uh, what they, they now have like 18 engineers and 35 technicians working there. That's a company that back in 2015 didn't exist and is exporting high-tech stuff. So um, I think many other things, many other examples. Another example, um, and, you'll, and we, uh, I'll, I'll highlight it because they're part of our presentation, Dragonfly Aerospace, they recently, as in Monday, shipped their next um, satellite out of the country to be launched. And um, there again, it's a company that uh, came out of Simbundila set effectively because they came out of Sunspace. And uh, now with an international investor, they are actually creating a, an incredible um, new engineering team for satellite development in South Africa. Um, and again, I think they're, they're, they're more than 30 engineers now working there already and again, it's a, it's a place that 2010 didn't exist in our country. So, um, you know, the economic value of that is, is just um, clearly remarkable. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about one portion of that upstream synthetic aperture radar. And I think the second speaker then set the scene of one of the examples of why we want to have synthetic aperture radars. Um, okay, now, is this going to work? Clearly not. Oh, there we go. Okay, and I think um, he already actually gave you the view of why SAR. So in the middle here, a picture by Ice Eye. Um, I would probably have to call him my competitor because, but I know the guy that's their um, PI or their principal researcher very well. Um, so he allowed me to do some of these things, use some of his videos. Ice Eye is a company that's uh, producing a constellation of SAR satellites at present. I think they already have 14 SAR satellites up. And it shows you there in the middle, the idea is that SAR works day and night and in all weather. Um, and that's the big advantage. So you have a satellite that can image the earth and it doesn't matter even if there's a hurricane below you, you can still see what's going on on the surface of the earth. Okay. Um, and the nice thing, it produces images of the land, not just of the sea. So you can see here a picture coming out of on the, on the left hand side, coming out of our own airborne synthetic aperture radar. This I think is like a 40 centimeter resolution. Um, so this is taken by an aircraft as you're flying past the area and allows you to see a whole lot of things that optically you can't. So the nice thing about SAR is we see things that complement what the optical guys are seeing. And um, yeah, it's maybe some things I can highlight. But the big thing is whenever you have man-made objects, you get a lot of bright scattering like that. So you can see in this area, man-made objects is all the bright stuff. You can see when there's farms and so forth, you see much darker scattering, but you see a slight differences between the various farms and their scattering. And that those differences we, we, we literally can use through AI to do things like classifying the crop, 
And also when we monitor over time, we can do things like monitor the health of the crop. And um, for example, an SAR image becomes pretty clear to you if a particular area has some disease, okay. Um, the guys in Canada makes use of this to, to monitor their crops every year and gives them a huge advantage in terms of getting their crop on the market at the right time and knowing exactly how much they're going to have to, they, they will have available to sell, for example. So a, a very important thing. Water shows up as black things. And it's very interesting. I don't, I don't have the optical picture here, but if you look at this same image in the optics, um, then that dam over there turns out to be green, okay? And it looks just like a grass patch. It's exactly the same color as the green grass around it. But on the SAR, it's pretty clear as a dam. Okay, but so diff and, and dams, water scat scatters away from the radar because it's a flat surface. So most of the energy is going away. That's why it turns out to be black. Now, that's not the only thing. The other thing, I mean, that's, I think the, to, to point out here is SAR is very useful in its own right, just not just the fact that it sees day and night and through clouds, but it can measure things that optically and with other techniques is impossible to get right, okay? Now, the first thing is all of you on your phone, if you open Google Maps and you click on a, a spot in the world, you'll see there's an altitude indicated there. It says this place on Earth is so high above sea level. Um, that data comes from a SAR system. It was, it was called the SRTM mission. And um, nicely enough, the guy that was the system engineer for that, his name was Dr. Yarpi von Sale. Some of you might know him, some might not. Unfortunately, recently he passed away. He's a hero of many of our radar guys. He's a Namibian guy that did his um, first undergrad studies in Stellenbosch, went to the US and became uh, part of JPL, uh, ended up in the end of his career to be the director of space exploration. And what you have on your phone there is because Yarpi built a radar for the SRTM mission, the satellite radar topography mission. Okay. Um, and so that's one of the things that we do. How do we do that? They basically take um, multiple images from, from, from space, multiple receivers. Those receivers are measuring the distance very finely to wavelength accuracy to the ground, okay? And then we can tell, tell the difference from two different receivers. And when you do that, we can form an interferogram. And that interferogram basically gives you a height map. So all these colored lines, basically, you can see every time it wraps, it's as the, the, the mountain goes higher, okay? So something we can do with SAR that's a very, very useful application is topography. And of late, um, they do what's called differential um, interferometry. So now you take different interferometers over time and you compare that data and then you can do substance mapping. So now we can detect fine, very fine scale, like millimetric scale um, movement in the surface of the earth. So well, obviously useful for things like earthquakes, um, useful for, and it would be useful, very, very useful for South Africa if we want to start monitoring all of our dams to see when the dam wall might actually start giving way, okay? You can detect it because it's millimetric changes. You can detect it long before the actual, an actual dam break event will happen. You will detect the substance. And there was a project in the 1990s where for the Katse Dam, while it was being built and while it was, they were adding water to it, they were basically doing that to make sure that the dam itself is not pushing away too much on the under, underlying um, surface. Okay. And another example I'll show, show over here just to show you the, the incredible things you can do. So imagine being like 40 kilometers away from some place, okay? This is an airborne sensor. You're flying 40 kilometers away today, and tomorrow you fly the same path 40 kilometers away. You take two pictures, and when you look at them in the intensity, they look exactly the same. Now, this particular case, it's a um, credit to IMSAR, guys in the US that does the, the, this, this example. That's a sports field, and it happened that they did this specifically on that day to show that they can detect that the grass on the sports field it's half getting cut, okay? The black that you see there is the difference between the grass that's cut and the grass that's not cut, okay? That, they can detect that very, very long away. Like I'm saying, 40 kilo, and, and you can even do this from space. There's now examples where people are doing this sort of thing called coherent change detection from space, okay? Now, imagine the other thing that they show you, there's quite a lot of other differences. So apart from the, you know, the, the straight amplitude differences you have here, because we measure phase, phase is, say, how many wavelengths do we fit in between us and the target, okay? And, and at C-band, for example, where we work oftentimes 5.5 centimeter is one wavelength and we can detect things maybe a 20th of the wavelength. So you're talking millimetric dif change differences. Now, what, what you see here also, for example, at the top there, um, you see a car there and you see how it drove around the edge of that sports field. Literally, it's tracks being left behind in the sand detected by a radar from 40 kilometers away, 
Okay, the sort of things that you definitely will struggle to do um, optically. Okay, so some very interesting applications in the field of saw. That's the wrong button. Let me go the other way. Okay, so synthetic aperture radar now is growing. I mean, it used to be this technology. Uh, I think people were um, sort of alluding to it. We were making use of radar set imagery and so forth from large corporations like Airbus and MDA, um, mostly accessible only to people uh, that was, you know, um, in big countries like the US, Japan, uh, maybe China. Uh, they all had SARS. And the rest of us had to pocket, you know, deep, dig deep in our pockets and pay them lots of money to get to a SAR image. Um, to 10 years ago, such an image would cost you maybe 200,000 Rand for one image. Okay. Yeah, that's changing uh, very, very fast, very rapidly now. So we are sitting in a world where, um, as you can see here, the number of SAR satellites is now exponentially increasing. Uh, the scale at the bottom is basically since 1978, 2018 over a year. And you see this exponential increase. And on the right, I'm showing you all the SAR constellations that's planned or are currently being launched. ISI there is leading the pack with 14 of their 18 planned launches already happened. You see Capella Space up there, another one that's already had launched six satellites out of 40. You see the Chinese at the top uh, launched one satellite, so that's, that's why it's a small little blip. They're planning to launch 96. Okay, so SAR data on the one hand is going to become, um, you know, just commonplace. It's going to become something that you, you're going to start seeing applications everywhere in every walk of life coming out of this data. It's, it's getting a lot cheaper to buy an image nowadays, probably probably uh, somewhere around 10,000 Rand an image um, if it's a very high resolution image uh, versus the 200,000 it was 10 years ago. Okay, and of course you've, you've got to take time and money into account as well, so it's you know big comparison. Okay, so um, the SAR market is growing. The reason for it is driven by there's many, many applications. I've talked and I think the previous speakers spoke about some, but literally in almost every sector of the economy, there is applications where SAR can make a difference, okay? When you talk about food security and agricultural monitoring, when you talk about cartography, so by having maps on your, G, uh, on your GPS and so forth and having that map updated every day, nowadays SAR systems are getting used to, to automatically generate these maps with, with um, polarimetric classification. Um, so basically every time something changes, it gets classified and the map gets updated and there's no, no doesn't have to be even people involved um, in the middle. Um, infrastructure monitoring, something that I think for our country would be very useful. Uh, we have a lot of problem with failing infrastructure, and it's something that SAR can play a big role in helping to monitor and to see where, when things go missing or to see when things change. Maritime safety and security was spoken about, so we don't have to talk about that. We had a mining session earlier, and people were talking about the safety in mines. For open cast mines, a huge thing that you can do with SAR is this differential interferometry, and this is an example from Janine Engelbrecht's work here at the CSIR where you detect the changes in a, in a slope and you can do slope stability monitoring and over time you can detect if something is going to go wrong. Okay. And with the cadence of satellites, with the, with the revisit rates going up higher with these constellations, you can get to the point where you can do this from space. You don't have to have a system on the mine that's in the way of the vehicles and might get run over and have lots of problems with dust and all of those sort of things. In the military, there's lots of applications. I'm not going to talk about that today. Um, in disaster management and flooding and many other things, fire detections, earthquake monitoring, and in oceanography. So, so this is the reason why we're seeing this boom in SAR happening. Okay. So obviously that sketches the background of why would the CSIR be wanting to work in SAR, and particularly in the sensor itself, not just in the downstream using the sensor. So we started a, a, a research team. Um, so I joined the CSR back in 1999, and my first project was on VHF synthetic, synthetic aperture radar. Um, and we built the VHF system that was the first VHF um, system, low, very low frequency system in the world. Um, and unfortunately, 2002, that project got cancelled. So for many years, I, we didn't work on SAR. We worked on, on target classification and other things using radar, but we used a lot of the principles, the imaging radar principles. And 2015, we came back to, the, to DST and we said to them, listen, guys, SAR is becoming such an important sensor that we cannot as a country not be here. If we, if we want to play and if we don't want to keep on digging into our own pockets to pay money for these sensors, we need to create a capability. We need to, to get to the point where we can start producing these things ourselves. So we started a project um, and we produced, um, at the CSR started developing what we call the airborne R&D facility. You have to start somewhere. We ended up with a system that's on a, on a um, light aircraft, very flexible system. And the whole idea was to be able to look 
into particular applications from a civilian perspective. It's DS DSI money, it's not focused on defense, even though I'm from the defense area. And um, so it's a C and L band system with multiple modes, uh, polarimetric modes, um, quad channel modes that allows us to do um, fully polarimetric imaging in C and L simultaneously. So we did quite a lot of work with that system. Um, this helped us to understand the SAR sensor development, all the issues that's, that, that's required. From there, we've now branched into two separate areas. On the one side, into airborne and UAV SAR sensor systems. So I'm showing there a family, and I'll talk a bit about that, of sensors that, or sensor technology that we're working on. And I'm showing on the right here, South Africa's first space-borne SAR that's currently under development at the CSR. Um, and um, it's a C-band SAR, and I think the previous speaker would be happy to know that it, it addresses pretty much all the questions. That, that's why I was laughing. Pretty much all of those requirements that he was talking about, obviously we know about those requirements. So we designed for that. And on the far right, I'm showing a, a system called MicroStar, which is a bi-static SAR. And we'll end off with my view um, at the end of the presentation about where I think SAR might be going into the future. We're seeing this huge disruption of the market at present. I think there's even, even the, the signs of the wave that will come thereafter is already there. Okay. Um, so just quickly, the airborne SAR, I'll just talk, give one slide of this. This is a very recent slide. Um, we, in this last year, we had a um, campaign which we call the Gauteng Measurement Campaign. We produced a whole lot of data over the Gauteng area for various applications. I showed the applications there in the middle, agriculture, mining, water bodies, wetlands, and disaster management. We um, created together with the SAR data for the image. We also um, managed to get some other uh, people on board. So we have hyperspectral camera and some ground truth things and even some space-borne X-band imagery. And we are about, with, uh, I think in, within the next month, um, all of this data that was captured here for these applications will be made available freely to the research community in South Africa. So this is an attempt for us to get the South African SAR capability in terms of um, understanding all the land applications um, and growing that in our industry people that will be able to create that pool of requirements of things that we need to do um, in our SAR sensors better, okay? Um, the, so already when we had the first meeting on this, there was like 20 people on the call. And by the time we had the last meeting on this, I think we had 80 people on a, on a team's call from more than 20 different entities in the country, universities, science councils, many small companies, SMMEs, all interested in, in making use of this data to start um, training their deep nets to do useful things, okay? So... Okay, so on the, on the UAV side, um, in the meantime, in, at the CSIR, and I think Andre and Yaku earlier this morning, if you were in the defense session, they alluded to this. We also managed to create in, within the CSR group our the first, very first um, C bands and um, phase array systems. Okay, so a phase array system is an antenna that allows you to scan its beam electronically without you having to mechanically move the antenna. Okay, has lots of, lots of advantages and on an airborne or a satellite system allows you to, without rotating the satellite or the aircraft, be able to scan, scan the beam. So a very useful thing. Um, what I'm showing over here is a roadmap of the various sizes of phase arrays. So from what we call the seagull through to the sea owl and the seahawk to the sea eagle. Now the, the difference between these ones, small UAVs and small UAVs, depending on the exact altitude they fly at, um, the, the hawk is aimed at, at um, what we call male, um, medium altitude, long endurance, and the sea eagle, hail, um, high altitude, long endurance. So and on the right-hand side here, you're talking about a platform flying at like 35,000 feet and higher. Um, over here, we're talking about a 20,000 feet um, out flight altitude, and over the year, the year maybe 10,000 and 5,000. Okay. Um, all the tech that, that's required to build this, the phase array tech, the processor with um, everything that goes in that, the receivers, um, that's all been generated um, either in partnership with other people or um, bought off the shelf and integrated. Okay. And so here's the first flight test of the phase, one of the phase array, the CL size phase array with the SAR image that it's producing uh, compared to a Google Earth image of that same area. And you can see a tremendous amount of detail that you can see in that SAR picture. Um, so I won't talk too much to that. Of course, we are also working in the defense area. And the nice thing about phase arrays is that you can um, subtract the, the different returns that you get from these different antennas. So now the reason that we had a multi-channel receiver there, we have four receivers behind, um, 
behind every one of those panels on the antenna. So these, and this antenna consists of four panels. We have four receivers there behind every antenna. So this is what the raw, what we call range Doppler map. Um, so this is velocity on the one axis, range on the other axis, and it, you see the clutter in the beam. So you see the, the area that the radar is looking at, okay? Um, and over there, you can pretty much see that it's impossible to see cars and things. This, the, the clutter from the ground is so bright that it's very difficult to see any vehicles in that image, okay? But if you, you know, I might have to come this side for it to play. Let me just do that. Um, okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll wrap up. So over here, you see the, um, the, li the little spots over there. And you can see this, um, it's not very clear, but you can start seeing spots in this picture that is the detections and then they become tracked and then you end up being able to detect and track all the moving targets. So now we can make a picture of the world and overlay onto that all the moving things. It becomes a very useful picture from a, from a military perspective. Okay, so now we'll quickly talk about the SARC payload. So South Africa is now, um, our group is now working on um, a C-band synthetic aperture radar based on the same phase rate technology. And it's um, the, the, the big thing about it, it was designed with all of these things in mind. So agriculture, mining, and coastal, okay? It's a 5.5 square meter antenna that we're gonna put into space based on software defined components and designed in such a fashion that it is highly reliable. So, so because of the way that we build it, effectively it gets us to the point where it's more than, more than double redundant and therefore it would have an eight year lifespan. And as you can see here by all the components, the way that it's manufactured, you see a lot of duplication of the same thing, which means it's highly manufacturable in the PC board industry in the country. So after we've basically developed one array like this, building the rest of the satellite um, of the payload becomes a cut and paste exercise, giving money to the industry. Okay. Okay, um, I'm getting told that I have been too long Pretty sure I'm not, haven't been longer than 20 minutes, but um, just quickly for the maritime guys. So you were seeing over there, um, the swaths. So we're talking more than 300 kilometers swath. And um, yeah, there's just some nice pictures that shows you how it was designed. Um, at the bottom there, you see it's been designed with, in partnership with two of the South African space companies. So Dragonfly and ACS. And there's some pictures of how the technology, how we're getting to building the actual tech based on where we are. So obviously you don't build a payload in one go. So we're at the engineering model phase. We have already built smaller versions of the array. We flight tested this and we um, have created all the tech in terms of the receivers and so forth that has to go onto that panel to make it work. Okay, and so I'll stop at this point. I'll, I won't go into the next slides. I'll stop, stop at this point. So lastly, I'll just say, I mean, you've seen what the amazing things we can do with SAR. You've seen the, the sort of things that's happening in the world. You see how everything is rapidly expanding and growing and soon SAR will be something that everybody of us um, is making use of in our daily lives. This I think is gonna turn it even further. So what, what I'm talking about here is um, a, a concept that we have here at the CSR called MicroStar, the micro satellite transmitter array. The idea is instead of putting all of the complex components to, to create a large satellite, um, and I was talking about a 5.5 square meter antenna, okay? That's a huge antenna to get into space. Um, instead of doing that, we put a much smaller antenna into space. And that antenna is the illuminator only. It doesn't have to record data. It doesn't have to get the data down to the ground. It means this, this system, the satellite basically, becomes like 100 times cheaper than this traditional SAR satellite. So for the same cost, we can now end up launching like 100 of them. So now we can have 100 transmitters going around the earth, providing the illumination, and that's where the word microstar comes from. It's like a whole lot of small little stars giving us RF illumination that's the right kind for us to, to be able to do radar on the ground. And now with receivers on the ground, either on towers or on airborne platforms, you can make SAR imagery right there where you need it, okay? And so I think the vision, and I think there's a couple of international people that's starting to buy into this vision Imagine effectively the sort of imagery I was showing, but coming from every cell, cell tower in the world. Um, now South Africa has many, many cell towers around our coast. We wanna be able to also detect the very small ships. Imagine every cell tower on, on this, on, uh, around our coast is making a SAR picture every 15 minutes because we have 100 satellites, every 15 minutes of the first 40 kilometers off coast. And we can basically monitor not only the big things, but even the small things. That's just one application 
there is, I think on, on the side here, I list quite, quite many of them. That, I think, is the future where SAR is going. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Vili. Um, unfortunately, we have run out of time and we will not be able to be taking any questions because the next session is already waiting for us. Um, but I would like to encourage every one of you who has questions to meet up with Vili, Ponzo, and Lizwe um, during the breaks. Thank you very much for attending the session. <laughs>